Welcome to Sri Lanka Bhante here in Wataraka. Um, before we begin, would you please briefly introduce yourself and your okay. background? Yes, well, um, well, we try to, the, the Dharma, the Buddha Dharma monk tries to limit himself to personalizing, to personification. And so even though we can give a brief background, we do not wish to go into it too much because we're trying to break down the self theory. So a background is that um, uh, there was interest in Buddha Dharma, uh, this way of understanding cause and effect of life events. Cause and effect in the mental body and cause and effect in the physical body. And so it was after studying Hindu texts and Chinese texts through the philosophies of those Tao, of the Tao and the Ayurveda and the Bhagavad Gita that um, there was no answers to the relevancy of experience in those mental and physical bodies. So it was decided to embark upon a study, a course of study in the Buddha Dharmas, in the Tipitaka. And with good advice from, from Buddhist monks in Sri Lanka, advising to stay with the suttas and don't veer off course as they, the word was being destroyed. The Dharma was being destroyed by personalities in the Buddhist community. So I began a, a study of this field and um, ten years later this is where I am now and um, I'm very happy that um, the, the results of Dharma and the, the, the guidance I've received from the Sangha have led to uh, some very great understandings of what this Dharma is all about, this Buddha Dharma. So um, this is where we are today. As an individual from Western world who is embarked upon study in the Buddha Dharma, what is your personal experience on crossing over to an entirely different culture? Okay, well that uh, question is uh, easily answered. Uh, through the advice Buddha giving on how to transform and this is by practicing the Eightfold Pathway. So it was through a disciplined approach to the Eightfold Pathway that allows transformation, that provides transformation to improve states, to accept things as they are. So that was the basis there for the transformation and it was realized that just by cycling through this Eightfold Pathway and improving all the points, all the factors each time, going through, reflecting what can be improved, what discipline can be applied and um, gradually the transformation takes place to the extent where it was recognized by family members and uh, even my father's asking we want to know what you've been doing <laughs> we've noticed a change and uh, we want to know what it is and I just mentioned it's, 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 it's the same thing it's the Eightfold Pathway that I've been practicing all this time and so he, my father said well I want to know how to do it <laughs> And so it just led from there because it was great that they could see this uh, transformation, this change from uh, from uh, from wild, from being wild to to uh, being tamed. That this eightfold pathway did. So it wasn't as though I had to, um, you know, point out that this is what happens. It was pointed out to me by family members. So that was uh, that's how it. That's how it is, and it doesn't change to today. It's still the Eightfold Pathway that um, is the practice for the, the cessation of um, unsatisfactory states, to reduce, to eliminate the stress, to bring the peace, the most profound, the most relaxing peace you'll ever experience in this, uh, following this Dharma.
Okay, now we know in Australia you have been practicing Buddhism to some extent, but um, now apart from doing that, have you traveled other countries in search of Buddhist teaching? Well, um, yes and no. I have traveled to other Buddhist countries, but not in search. I, it was an interest that I had, so it was um, just traveling to see what the other monks were doing, observing their behavior, and uh, looking for a parallel to the way the practice is described in the suttas of the, the Tipitaka. So I've traveled to um, many countries. I've traveled to, I first traveled to Sri Lanka and Thailand, and Malaysia, to Burma, to India, to Nepal, and, um, and the United States and New Zealand and uh, just observing, just watching to see how this um, practice, see if the, where this practice has uh, parallels to the Buddha Dharma in, described in the Tipitaka. So, um, so it was very interesting just moving along and see, watching these, these various monasteries how they practiced the Dharma and um, how they understood it and to see what progress there was in Dharma towards Nibbana. Nibbana being the goal and this is what we all look for and we look for the behavior of monks that parallels to a Nibbana pathway so described in many suttas in the Nikayas. And uh, it's certainly a mixed world out there. <laughs> we have the three major traditions, the, the uh, Vajrayanas, uh, the Tibetans, and the Mahayanas with the Chinese and the Japanese, and the Theravadas with the Sri Lankans, the Burmese and the Thais. And um, it's very interesting just to observe the way they practice and um, so in the mainstream it's just all like one big school with various ways of practice. So I thought about traveling further afield and uh, seeing if I would walk into some place where there would be a subdued practice, a practice of um, restraint, uh, see the contentment and, um, and just those parallels of practice described in the suttas. There's not many places that are like that. They are, most places are very busy, a lot of uh, social service and a lot of academic uh, pursuit, but not much in the way of um, Buddha Dharma pursuit. And then the ones that do have a Buddha Dharma practice, it is a practice of a guru not of the Buddha and so they practice in a step-by-step -step movement away from the Buddha Dharma, the way the Buddha advised to practice. So, um, so this searching for places where this may be, I think, and I might one day walk in, but oddly enough I found two places in these travels that do practice this Buddha Dharma the way described in the Tipitaka. And one of those places was in the United States and another place here in Sri Lanka. So Venerable Sir, now, uh, you know, you're talking about the Buddha Dharma, like mainstream when we talk about Buddha Dharma, it's it's more people thinking about the religion, Buddhist, Buddh, as, as, a, as a Buddhism as a religion. Now, do you see a difference uh, between the religion and core teaching of Buddha Dharma, or is it the same thing? Yes, well, there is and there isn't. Uh, depending on where you are, there are different ratios of Buddha Dharma 
and religion. However, when we read in the suttas, we find in that this type of religion is not in the suttas. It appears as though this is a coming back in from the days of the Buddha of the Brahmas, the Brahma religion, where they worshipped, where they had rituals and ceremony for anything and everything they could think of. So, um, so there is a difference between those two and the more pure of the practice would be the, the Buddha Dharma without the religion, without the chanting, without the worshipping. Because this is a distraction away from the path of Nibbana. And the practice of exercising the cessation of Dukkha. This will not be recognized when Dharma Buddha Dharma takes second place, which is what has happened a lot because it's easier around the place. However, so that would be how that would be best addressed, and this can be easily verified just by reading the suttas. They're there for reference, that's the idea of them. They're the, uh, the words that were heard to have been spoken in the day of the Buddha, and they haven't changed. Those Original words are still there, waiting and open for individuals to translate. And this is the better course of practice to understand what occurred during the Buddha's life in those Nikayas, the Tipita, mainly the Nikayas, the Suttas, they are the more closer to the Buddha word. Buddha word providing the Buddha Dharma, this pathway to Nibbana, is all we are trying to achieve is Nibbana. And when we find a community that is talking only Nibbana and what conditions are required for Nibbana, these factors of the Eightfold Pathway there we find Nibbana. There we find the, the confidence and the way forward to Nibbana, this most restful peace of mind and body to be fully experienced here and now for those wishing and willing to do such. Never to be found in a religion, only getting further away from Buddha Dharma it leads to Nibbana. No rest at all. So now, um, you know, a lot of uh, people, those who practice Buddhist teaching or Buddhism, uh, they visit India to see all these places of uh, Buddha's birthplace and his attainment and his uh, Mahaparinibbana, uh, etc. So have hmm. you been to India and would you like to Tell us about your personal experiences about yes, these places. Yes, yes, sure, yes. I, uh, I first went to India in 2004. <clears throat> and, um, 2004, no, sorry, 2005. Some, uh, some friend, friendly Sri Lankan monks I knew in Brisbane said that uh, they were going on a pilgrim tour around the Buddha lands in North India. And, uh, and, and uh, suggested I come along and I thought well this would be very good because it was about 12 months no about 18 months after I'd been um, reading up on the Buddhist texts and I thought this is a very good idea I also reading in the the Parinibbana Sutta where the Lord Buddha suggesting that at least in your lifetime, one lifetime, you visit these places, you visit one of these places that uh, he has been to. And these important places he listed as his birthplace, his place of the first sermon, his, um, oh, what was his other one, his birthplace, the first sermon, 
and um, and his enlightenment place and the Bodhi tree and and his uh, death, the Parinibbana at Kushinara. So, uh, so I think, and yeah, this is good. And when we're going with a uh, a uh, oh, there's about a hundred pilgrims from from Kandy in Sri Lanka. So I thought, wow, this would be a good trip. So um, and very economical too. We uh, we uh, flew from well, I flew from Australia to to Kandy, and then in uh, the whole group there's about a hundred, hundred and twenty. We travelled by bus to the to the Colombo Airport. We flew to Madras. We stayed there for two nights, and then we travelled by train to Varanasi, and then we travelled from Varanasi all around the, the Buddhist sites, Sarnath, Buddha Gaya, Lumbini, Savati, Kushinara, and many others, Vaishali, many other places, Kosambi, and, um, and this was very good. I was thinking, oh, well, this is great. I'm seeing all these things, all these monasteries in Buddha Gaya and the monasteries in Kushinara and, and uh, Lumbini and and um, Savati, the Jetavana Grove. And I'm looking at these, I see, looking at the construction, I'm very interested in the construction. I am from the construction industry. So I'm very interested looking and seeing how these all put together and how they still there today. And, and the, the, uh, the, the stupas, the burial mounds, and the memorial mounds, and the Ashokan pillars, all these Buddhist artifacts. It was a real eye opener to be with this and with all these people, it was uh, it was very very motivating and energizing. We're going everywhere, Rajagaha, the Vulture's Peak. We're walking everywhere, and um, and then it was uh, then it was about um, just recently, uh, December, November in 2012, I decided to go back there again, and this time. I was following the uh, the book that um, a monk wrote for uh, pilgrims, which associated all the suttas the Lord Buddha spoke about, and the different towns all throughout northern India, all throughout the Buddha land. So I thought this would be very good. I can um, I can go place by place and uh, recall the suttas in this place and and get more more uh, feeling more feeling out of this. However, when I went to the uh, the visa office in Kandy to uh, collect the passport for the, the Indian visa, I met, I ran into a Sri Lankan monk there and was talking to him and he suggested that, um, well I suggested that if he, he in India at the airport when I arrived there he can, uh, he can travel around these lands with me because I have the car. A car was being supplied, so he could he could come. So um, so we talking, and then he's suggesting that um, there's also another alternative to this Buddha land suggested in India. And uh, I'm very interested because I know I, at that point I knew of two alternatives, and that was the first one being the lands in North India, the second one being the lands in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Gandhara, Taxila, they also referred to as birthplace of the, of the Buddha and, and uh, roaming places of the Buddha. So I think, you know, oh, here's another one, here's third. So he telling me, yes, this, this beautiful island, Sri Lanka, has also been suggested as the land of the Buddha. So I say, oh, okay. So I say, well, I say, well, why are we going to India then? <laughs> And he's saying, well, we can, we can do further research in India and this time we can make the comparisons compared to the geography described in the suttas and the customs described in the suttas and see if they are in place in India. So I think, yeah, this, this is good, this is okay, this is very good. So we're doing this, we, uh, we're checking out the variations in the, um, in the various places and and in Lumbini, we're looking for the cave that the Lord Buddha described in the Saka Sutta, the Indashala cave, 
And we're looking around Lumbini and we couldn't find any cave. Any caves. So we're thinking, okay, here's, here's a good point. This is a good starting point. We find in a different straight away to what has been described in the suttas. So then we're going down, we go into um, Buddha Gaya, and uh, we're seeing that the, uh, the distance between the banyan tree and the Bodhi tree that Lord Buddha attained enlightenment under, there in Buddha Gaya, India, this banyan tree on the other side of the river. And it didn't make sense that uh, after awakening up to many falsehoods, that Lord Buddha would then traipse through the river bank and up the other side to a banyan tree back and forwards for seven weeks. So um, we're thinking, yeah, well, okay, this is another one. And then we're also reading in that sutta that, um, I think in the same sutta, that um, for seven weeks he walking backwards and forwards. And on the last week of that month, <clears throat> he decided to let this, this awakening be known to his five friends who were looked after him before his awakening. And they were in Sarnath. And that uh, in the next week he would walk there. Well, we, we see in that uh, Sarnath is, uh, goodness me, I, I can't be too accurate, but it's easy enough to, for everyone to, to measure with the amount of maps around the world today on the distance between Buddha Gaya and Sarnath is well over 350 kilometers and would take much longer than one week to walk that far. And I know I've heard many, I've heard some people saying, oh, well, he flew. <laughs> oh, that's a funny one. I've heard lots of monks mention that one too about other instances where he flew, they flew. And this is how they cover up this, uh, this discrepancy. Anyway, so to speak, that's, that was just some. And, um, okay, so I'm thinking, yes, this is very interesting. This, this looking is very interesting. And also thinking, yes, well, this land also in North India, very barren, very dusty, and is not fitting for such a great man, such a Buddha, to be born in and to roam around. It just didn't make sense that why would such a great being be born in such a desolate area? Such a... Man, just, you, you have to go there to experience it. The air quality is not bad and it's not good. The, um, the pollution, the smog, the dust, and there's, I don't, there's, uh, there's no scenery, so to speak, of unless you go a long, long, long way away. So then, um, that was good. I took the monk that was with me. He was, he fell um, prey to the uh, the allergies there, and so I took him up to the Himalayas, and we we spent the rest of the time in the Himalayas. And uh, then when we come back to Sri Lanka, uh, we have a look at uh, the places that have been suggested as the Lord Buddha's places in Sri Lanka. And so we go into Hiriwaduna the awakening, this, the Bodhi tree, the, the uh, Jaya Siri Maha Bodhi tree, we're looking there and we're also reading that um, every year on the Vaisak, this tree sprouting a white sapling. So this is very interesting. And then we're looking and seeing the, the artifacts around there made of solid stone. The seat that King Muchalinda made for Lord Buddha and the chamber that he made to protect him from the, the rain. This all made sense compared to a big snake coming out from somewhere and spreading his hood to protect him from the rain. Um, that's very mythological and sort of like fantasy. I suppose if you're very interested in Disneyland, this would be very appealing. So um, anyway, but I thought, well, this is very interesting. And, and we were, we were in this place at Hiriwaduna for four days because as soon as we got in, well, we went there when it was raining and uh, the river rose and they say in this river, the Naranjala, and we couldn't get out because it flooded the road. So we're there for four weeks, four days, sorry. And this was very nice time, very, very well spent, just 
just um, just observing, just sitting, and just this um, this uh, very amazing place. Uh, to be truly appreciated is to go there. That's the best thing to do. No point listening to anybody. You, it is best go there and experience this place and see these these factors in place. See the Vajrayana stone at the base of the Jaya Siri Mahabodhi tree with the tree wrapped around this Vajrayana stone. That's quite something. Anyway, so that was that one. And then we are going up to Essen Basangala and they say in this is the Isipitana Park, this is the deer park. So we see in the Arahat cave there, we're looking at more out of it. And this country in Sri Lanka all around, very very green, very scenic, and this makes more, much more sense to be in the land that uh, the greatest human being would ever grace. This this beautiful island of Sri Lanka with its with its beautiful hilly country and its beautiful green scenery and, and these wonderful artifacts that made sense. This uh, Essen Basangala is uh, shorter than one week's walk from the, the Bodhi tree, the awakening tree, the Siri Sadda tree, the Bodhi tree is in distance, this place probably about 50 to 70 kilometers away. And on the way in between, there's another place called Ritigala that I visited in 2004. And uh, this is suggested as being the, the Jaitavana, the Jaitavana grave. Such a magnificent place. The stone carved buildings that remain there, the ruins, and the pathways that are still there, solid stone pathways that just meander throughout the forest. And you just think, goodness me, like, yes, this, this, this could be really something like a place that Anita Pindika gave to Lord Buddha for him to stay in because of its beauty and because of then what was built around. Why would anything else be built there, for goodness sakes? This mountain range, this Ritigala mountain range, this sheer beauty. And so then, then after that, uh, I undertook um, the rest by myself, I went to um, what was suggested as the Lumbinia, just outside of Kandy, and um, I was I was actually helped along the way because I had discovered the hidden treasures on YouTube, and these kind gentlemen, these Dharma gentlemen, had taken videos of these places that allowed me to look for the Sal tree at the Bambaragala caves which is suggested as being the Lumbinia. And I found this beautiful Sal tree and it was just, the timing was just right when I got there because all around the tree were these white crystals and this beautiful fern like grass growing. And this, the roots of the tree were goodness me, 12 inches thick, 12 inches in diameter and travelling for 30 metres. And I'm thinking, wow, this is a very old tree and no others around. And to the side of the, uh, the major grounds, to the side. So it was only recently that I was there in um, 2013 and I was there again and I was picking up some of these white crystals and I a Sri Lanka man came along and he, he was very happy to see a, a monk around this tree and I pointed out the importance of this tree and but this time there were brown leaves covering everything I was, I was removing them and he was saying he says Sadhu he said Bhante he says if you give me your email address I wish to clean this place up and then send you a photo of it cleaned up because this tree very important in the history of the Buddha so that was just a wonderful thing to happen there. And anyway, then after that, I'm looking at that and I see in the caves, the Indashala cave and the Brahmi, 
Well, they, this, the scholar monks say Brahmia, but it's uh, the uh, the actual name for the script is Helabima, which was the ancient name of Sri Lanka. So this Helabima script is is inscribed in stone above the caves, indicating that these caves were given to Lord Buddha as a gift for Lord Buddha and the Sangha. So I think, well, this just gets better. Here now are some evidence leaning that way and we have a very beautiful land that is befitting the, the uh, greatness of, of the greatest man to ever grace the planet. And so then it was on to uh, Buddha Gala, which they say is the, the Kushanara. So then I traveled to, to Buddha Gala through this beautiful scenic country and out at the end of the Kaltota range at the bottom is Buddha Gala. And the monk there very welcoming and uh, providing a room to stay in. And uh, he had very many cuttings up of the newspaper reports suggesting this, the Parinibbana of Lord Buddha. He's very happy with that. And then right next door to this temple are the grounds where the cremation took place. And this beautiful, carved into this beautiful hillside, this green hillside, the trees and the stone, solid stone foundations are still there and the solid stone stairways leading up the stairs. Truly remarkable. So this really lends a lot of weight. And this is how we assess things these days in this modern world. We measure it and we weigh it. And through weight of evidence, we can see that these things are happening. These things have occurred. These things relative to the Sutta in Sri Lanka. Now, there is another site that has been discovered. And this, they say, this site over 1,600 acres. This site, and has been suggested as Rajagaha. They call in Rajagala. The ruins there, I've seen the photographs. I am yet to go there. I hope to go there shortly. But the, uh, the evidence is there too from the photographs I see. The cave that was built for the first council and all the other caves and all the ruins and the ruins of the, the various tribes, the various states that have come there and, and uh, made themselves be known to the Lord Buddha. They all there, I've seen the photographs, and so now I go there and I look in. And, um, and I also ask him, is there a mountain nearby this, this place? And they say, yes, there are many mountains. So <laughs> this is going to be very interesting indeed. Now, ha having traveled these places, I must say that uh, it's very inspiring and um, very deepening of this Buddha Dharma because I have now met a monk here and his community and all they talk about is Buddha Dharma. That monk, Dharma Lankara, hearing Wati Karaka. Wata Reka. I get this pronunciation right. And this is all they're talking about constantly. Non stop Buddha Dharma as described in the suttas, the Sutta Nikayas. But we are getting closer to the word of the Buddha here, very close. Because as the scholars and other monks understand, the Buddha spoke a language different to the common language. And so this Buddha language 
is now coming to the front. And this is giving us more depth of experience in this Dharma, this Buddha Dharma, that you won't find anywhere else. If you do, please let me know. I'm happy to go there and see for myself. I find in one other place in the travels where this Buddha Dharma is rejoicing the way it is in the suttas, and that is the, the establishment, or should I say, the, the, um, the forest center in Missouri, USA, of Bhante Vimala Ramsey. So there's two monks close to this Buddha Dharma. And uh, we're helping each other now because this fast communication network available to everyone, the internet, is there for all. This is the age of information. You want any information, you can find it. No different to the old days when, when we wanted information, we went to the library. This is the same thing. This is an electronic library. Yes, we have to be careful what we read, but we can verify such by way of practice. This can be easily verified by way of practice. No other way can this be verified. This Buddha Dharma. But this Buddha Dharma brings us closer and closer to Nibbana. This most restful peace on this planet and the pathway leading to it provided to us by Lord Buddha. So Venerable Sir, I have one more final question for you. Now, with, the, with this conversation, what's your message to the entire world? Well, the whole world has this message and wants this message. And this message is peace. And this peace begins right here. Right here is where this peace begins. Not anywhere else but here. And I'm not meaning this place here in Sri Lanka. I'm talking about this place here, where you are right now, this body. This where peace begins, right here. So if we wish this peace, this is a very good way to begin, is to follow this Eightfold Pathway and see the progression, see the change. This is what does it. This Buddha Dharma, this Eightfold Pathway, providing the transformation to peace. Venerable Sir, uh, we know you come to this place here in Pataraka all the way from Australia. Now, we, we express our heartiest gratitude for your presence here and for your time and uh, for your good motivation to speak to the world. So here again, we wish you all the best for your spiritual journey. And thank you very much. Okay, very good. I'm very happy to do this. And may everybody find Nibbana. Nibbana here. Lord Buddha saying, it is possible in seven days, Nibbana. Thank you.